And it's time we have the pleasure to welcome Neil Ferguson, one of the world's renowned historians. Thank you very much. Please take your seats. The floor is yours, and it's a great honor having you here. Well, I, um, I thought it was a mistake to announce a 10-minute break. But now that that break has been cancelled, I'm in the uncomfortable position of depriving you all of the coffee and sustenance and bathroom breaks that you were craving. But this is not the least of my problems. Because in addition to depriving you of these comforts, I'm also going to be a rather gloomy oracle. Those of us who come to speak at Delphi feel inclined to be oracular. But I'm afraid uh, my prophecies will be more Cassandra than the oracle at Delphi. So you may begin to wish you'd gone for the 10 minute break. I'm only going to speak uh, for 19 minutes, uh, so cross your legs. I want to remind you, as this is an economic forum, that in the 2010s, this country suffered one of the very few great depressions that have been since the 1930s. If you look at the data from the International Monetary Fund, Greece saw per capita gross domestic product me measured on a comparative basis plunge by more than a quarter. Now, I just happened to choose Germany as the economy to compare Greece with. But you can see in these charts that while Greek per capita GDP crashed by more than a quarter, Germany's barely missed a beat during the whole period that followed the global financial crisis. Notice too that there was no increase in unemployment. In Germany, it continued to decline. Whereas in Greece, unemployment rose uh, to a 2013 peak in excess of a quarter of the labor force. These are Great Depression numbers that you would find if you studied the history of the United States or Germany after 1929. Now, the recent fiscal and macroeconomic stabilization of Greece are causes for real congratulation. You can see on the left-hand side of my slide that Greece's fiscal position on the eve and during the financial crisis was catastrophic. Whereas today, even after the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic, Greece's public finances, measured by the annual deficit, are in comparable health to those of Germany. This is an astonishing achievement, which you should never understate. And it is a pleasure for me, as a native-born Briton, to congratulate Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis on all that he has achieved. It is a remarkable feat and singles him out, in my view, as the most able European political leader of them all. By comparison, it might be said that some other countries have been losing their marbles, to use a colloquial English expression. These days, the British look with admiration at the political stability of Greece. Where did you last have three prime ministers in the space of one year? However, I don't think that the Greeks can disregard the increasingly dangerous geopolitics of this decade. And I have the feeling that you would like to. But my message is that Greece 
can never be Switzerland. If you look at opinion polling on two distinct subjects, the situation of Ukraine and the threat posed by the People's Republic of China, you will see from these charts that only Hungary is less sympathetic to the plight of Ukraine than Greece in Europe today, and only Hungary is more favorable in its view of China than Greece. And it seems to me that this evinces a somewhat delusional view of Greece's geopolitical situation. Ask yourselves, in the world wars of the 20th century, was Greece unscathed? Could Greece step aside? Could Greece be Switzerland? You know your Greek history, and you know that that was not, for a moment, conceivable. Henry Kissinger died last year shortly after celebrating his 100th birthday. It seems to me that if you want to understand the geopolitical situation we find ourselves in, he was a reliable guide. No one understood the Cold War better than Henry Kissinger. I asked him just over four years ago at a conference in Beijing, if we were in a new Cold War, if China had taken the place of the Soviet Union, and he replied memorably, we are in the foothills of a Cold War. A year later, he upgraded that to the mountain passes of a Cold War. And the year before he turned 100, when I asked him about it again, he said, the second Cold War will be even more dangerous than the first, because, of course, we now have artificial intelligence as well as nuclear weapons. The great paradox of the Second Cold War is that unlike in the first, there is considerable, indeed vast, economic interdependence between the two rival superpowers. Although the US-China trade deficit has come down somewhat since its peak in the middle uh, of the last decade, it still remains around a third of the total US trade deficit. And when people talk of decoupling, I would merely remind you that for Apple to reduce its production in China from 100% to 90% of its hardware is scarcely decoupling. It's barely even de-risking, to use the fashionable word of the time. Now, this is because globalization is really a complex network of supply chains and you can see in these brilliant diagrams from the recent work of my old friend Hyun Song Shin at the Bank for International Settlements just how complex these networks are. To decouple the two largest economies in the world from one another when the supply chains resemble these kaleidoscopic complex diagrams is an almost impossible undertaking. Let's consider the situation of Greece in the globalized economy. We've just been hearing about the enormous importance of Greece's shipping industry. And yes, it is important because Greece, as much as any country, is bound up in that international network of supply chains. The Atlas of Economic Complexity allows you to see that Greece has trading partners everywhere Though the destination of its exports is overwhelmingly European, those are the blue squares on the diagram on the left. Greece imports from all over the world, but again, predominantly uh, from Europe. Notice, however, that in 2021, more than a tenth of Greek imports came from China, 6% from Russia, and just 2% from the United States. 
the implications of Cold War II are painfully obvious. Think only of the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, the following year, the year after these figures were calculated for Greek trade. The network that I just described to you, a network in which we are all individually nodes, has come under a sustained series of shocks in the space of the last four years. First, of course, was the pandemic. We almost take for granted that we can meet here in this crowded, reasonably crowded, and somewhat overheated tent, and not a mask is to be seen. And one reason we've begun to forget the pandemic is that other crises have come after it thick and fast. In my last book, Doom, a cheerful title, if ever there was one, I argued that in the wake of the great public health disaster of the pandemic, other disasters would follow in a kind of cascade of conflicts. After the plague, I said, will come the war. And sure enough, war came. It came to Afghanistan. When the sudden, abrupt withdrawal of American forces handed that country and its people, including many who had cooperated with the US and its allies back to the tyranny of the Taliban. Scenes in Kabul were reminiscent of the fall of Saigon, for those of you old enough as I am to remember that black day. And that was just the first. Then came the invasion of Ukraine. Now this, it seems to me, is equivalent to the impact of the Korean War at the outset of the first Cold War, the first major hot war that makes it clear that you really have entered a new era, that the interwar period that began with the collapse of the Soviet Union or perhaps with Gorbachev is well and truly over. The war in Ukraine is a fundamentally different war in its scale and intensity than the wars in the Balkans that followed the breakup of Yugoslavia. It is a return to a kind of war that Europe has not seen since 1945, in which the levels of destruction and the lethality of the violence really do recall the carnage of the world wars. Indeed, the battlefields uh, of eastern Ukraine closely resemble those of the First World War, except that drones fly overhead, greatly increasing the accuracy of weapons and the lethality of the war. That was February 2022. In October last year, another war broke out when a terrorist attack by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad wreaked havoc, slaughter, and rape on the population of Israel. The problem about wars is that unless they are stopped very quickly, they become very hard to stop indeed. If you look at every war that there's been in the world since 1816, since the period after Napoleon's defeat, it's striking that while many wars are brief, lasting just a few months, a really large proportion of wars last much longer than that. Indeed, I would say, as a kind of rule of thumb, if a war lasts longer than six months, it's highly likely to last quite a bit longer than one year. A quarter of the wars since 1816 have lasted more than a year, and of these, 16 lasted more than two years and four more than five years. After the opportunities had been missed to bring an early end to these conflicts, and I believe opportunities were missed, it became progressively harder with every passing month to achieve peace. In other words, you must expect these wars in Ukraine and in the Middle East to continue and potentially to escalate. Greece, as I said, ain't Switzerland, and it never will be. Now, to be fair, as an integral member of the Transatlantic Alliance, 
Greece is one of the very few European members of NATO with a serious defense budget. In fact, on the latest NATO figures, as a percentage of GDP, Greece's is twice that of Germany. And this is an impressive thing to maintain when you consider the fiscal challenges that Greece has faced. And there's still very large debt that is a hangover from the previous period of economic crisis. But remember that more than 60% of total NATO spending is accounted for by one member, and that is the United States. And every member of NATO, including Greece, must be very concerned about the growing vulnerabilities of that most important member. Ferguson's law, the only law of history that I recognize, states that when a great power spends more on interest payments on its debt than on defense, its greatness is likely to fade. If you look at the most recent Congressional Budget Office projections, you can see that this year is the year when debt payments, interest on the federal debt, exceed the US defense budget for the first time in American history. Not only that, but by 2040, interest payments are likely to be twice the size of the defense budget. This is not an encouraging outlook for any American ally, and that includes Greece. An even bigger problem, which I think is strikingly illustrated by this chart, is that in the space of 20 years, leadership in global manufacturing has decisively shifted from the United States to China. In 2004, just a few years after China joined the World Trade Organization, US manufacturing value added was more than twice that of China's. By 2022, China's manufacturing value added was twice that of the United States, a profound reversal of economic fortune. And ladies and gentlemen, if there is one thing we have learned from the war in Ukraine, in a conventional conflict that is protracted over months and then years, manufacturing matters. You must be able to supply your armies with shells and now with drones on a massive scale. Under these circumstances, it would be extraordinarily dangerous for the United States and its allies to risk a Taiwan semiconductor crisis by analogy with the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. The analogy is a good one, you know. If you ask Americans what they would do if China blockaded Taiwan, 62% say that the US Navy should be sent to run that blockade. In 1962, it was the United States that blockaded an island just off its coasts, Cuba, and it was Khrushchev who had to send a naval force to run that blockade. It was the closest we came to World War III in the whole of the Cold War. And it is truly fantastic to me that any policymaker in either Beijing or in Washington would want to roll the dice of rerunning the Cuban Missile Crisis with Taiwan as the island. Bear in mind what Cuba's principal exports were and still are, that's right, cigars. Some of you may still smoke cigars, but you'll acknowledge that compared with the most sophisticated seven nanometer semiconductors, they're not economically terribly important. A crisis over Taiwan would plunge the global economy into a far greater crisis than the global financial crisis of 2008. Because at the very heart of innovation, of artificial intelligence is TSMC, which dominates the production of the most sophisticated semiconductors. Finally, and unfortunately, you and America's other allies cannot count on US politics, especially now that artificial intelligence will play a part in the campaigns to deliver greater 
political stability in less than seven months' time. Ladies and gentlemen, I warned you that I would be somewhat Cassandra-like, but I would be neglecting my duty to Simeon and the other organizers of this forum if I did not point out that geopolitics applies to Greece too, and it applies to Greece even more, indeed a lot more, than it does to Switzerland. Thank you very much indeed.